Welcome to Anchored by Truth, brought to you by Crystal Sea Books. In John 14.6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Our goal is to encourage everyone to grow in the Christian faith by anchoring themselves to the secure truth found in the inspired, inerrant, and infallible Word of God. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. The Gospel of John, chapter 2, verse 11, New International Version. Hello! Welcome to Anchored by Truth, brought to you by Crystal Sea Books. I'm Victoria Kay in the studio, and today we are going to bring a new series on Anchored by Truth featuring Jay Ammerman. We heard Jay's remarkable story in our last episode of Anchored by Truth, how Jay was delivered from an opiate addiction through his faith in Christ, and how that beginning has led Jay to a place where he is almost finished with his seminary training. Jay's very interesting life has included being an Army combat medic, working in a hospital, and owning a business that helps people who are troubled by nuisance critters, critters that can be destructive, as they are cute. But Jay does so humanely, by trapping them and transporting them far enough into the countryside where they won't be a bother to people anymore. Jay's life has included its shares of twists and turns, but today Jay is in the final stage of finishing seminary because he has strongly felt the call of the Lord to full-time service. So let's welcome Jay Ammerman, the owner of Black Thumb Services to Anchored by Truth. Jay, your story is amazing. But the one constant throughout has been the presence of Christ. And when we met you, we realized that Christ is such a powerful presence in your life that we thought it would be wonderful if you could share some of your passion about Christ with others. So when we found out that one subject that you really wanted to discuss was the miracles that Christ performed as part of his earthly ministry, It seemed like a good idea to get the show started by playing one of our life lessons with a laugh on the miracles of Christ. Our life lessons with a laugh are short five to six minute segments, each with a different lesson to help kids get started with understanding all of the joy and richness in the Bible. So let's listen to one of those. This one has to do with Jesus's first miracle, which was to turn water into wine at the wedding at Cana. Hey, Crystal Sea Grippers and Grinners, R.D. Fierro here today to begin a new life lesson with the Laugh Series. This one is on the miracles of Jesus. With me is that madcap maestro of mirth and mayhem. R.D., before you mess up my name again, let me just tell the folks, you're here with Jerry. Me, Jerry. And... Actually, Jay Cakes. What? I was going to introduce our guest first. Miracle Mitch. Awesome. And of course, you completely forgot about Be Right. He usually does. And he's not the only one. It's not nice to forget Be Right. Okay, okay. Sorry, sorry. And I guess Mitch is the guy over near the back wall, filling those barrels with water from the hose? Oh, oh, he's not just Mitch. He's Miracle Mitch. Awesome. Dude, how do you keep saying his name like that? That's pretty cool. And, ooh, bit surprised it's not obvious to you, Jay Cakes. I mean, the connection between water barrels and miracles in the Bible is pretty obvious. Don't you think so, B. Right? It's obvious to me, R.D., But perhaps not to Jay Cakes. He seems to be off his fiber regimen again. Ah, jeepers. I suppose you want to talk about the first miracle that Jesus performed, where he turned water into wine at a wedding feast in the village of Cana. So, in a way, it's like we're going to hear something through the grapevine. Ooh, good one, Jay Cakes. I get it. Grapevine, wine, heard it through the grapevine. Oh, I get it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm down with that, J.K. Down. Way down. How about you, Mitch? In 
Indeed, j Cakes. No, no. That song is particularly appropriate for Miracle Mitch. No, no, no. My name is not j Cakes. It's... Ooh, a lot of focus on you today, j Cakes. Think you might be right about that fiber thing, B, right? <sighs> At any rate, to return to our lesson, the Gospel of John, Chapter 2, tells us that the first miracle that Jesus performed was at a wedding feast. Jesus turned the water in six stone water jars into wine because the wine the groom had purchased had run out. Such jars typically contain about 20 gallons each. That's why we brought in Miracle Mitch awesome. to help set the stage for today's lesson. <laughs> miracle Mitch? You mean that strange guy filling the barrels is going to turn water into wine? I don't believe no, that's good. of course not. Mitch isn't going to turn water into wine. I am. Huh? You're going to perform a miracle? I mean, if you got my name right, that would be a miracle. Not sure what you mean by that, J-Dude. J-Dude is referring to your seeming inability to use his preferred nomenclature. However, speaking precisely, which is what I, as a superior artificial intelligence system, do, R.D. saying any particular name would not be a miracle according to the Bible. I'm not so sure about that. Well, what B. Wright means is that a biblical miracle involves God temporarily suspending the operation of natural laws for the purpose of verifying that someone is an authentic messenger of the Lord. Precisely. Some of the best-known examples of biblical miracles, of course, are the miracles Moses performed during the period in which he was leading the delivery of the Israelites from Egyptian slavery. Not only were the miracles an essential part of God's plan, but they validated Moses as an authentic prophet of God. Now, of course, I'm not a prophet. Oh, no kidding. Though it is pretty easy to predict mayhem is coming when you're around. Look, None of that explains why Miracle Mitch is here. And why is he called Miracle Mitch? Awesome. Anyway. Mitch is legendary for his prowess in growing large fruits and vegetables. Last year, he had scuppernongs as big as sweet potatoes. Radishes as big as rutabagas. Gooseberries big as guavas. Huh? Why are we talking about fruit salad? And why is Mitch here to begin with? Oh, we didn't have a hose long enough to reach from the outside spigot. And we thought Mitch would add a bit of flair. How many other people do you know called Miracle Mitch? Awesome. You almost done, Mitch. The preparations are nearing completion, R.D. I note that the six water barrels now contain a total of 119.234 gallons of water. For those who prefer the metric system, that's 451.3484 liters. Mitch, why don't you fetch j Cake some water in one of those clear plastic cups so he can be sure that water is all that went into the barrels? <laughs> uh, no thanks. I have no idea where that hose has been. Oh, this one's clean. It's not the one I use to spray fertilizer or other stuff. Well, at least you can see that the water is clear. Now, I'm going to put the lids on the barrels. One more. Got it. All right. Here we go. We're going to get our water transformed into grape juice. Huh? Mitch, dip out some of that grape juice and let J Cakes taste it. What? No, still not going there. Although I will admit, whatever is in that cup does look like grape juice. How'd you do it? It's a miracle, Jerry. No, no, it's not. The fact that you call me Jerry, though, that may be. No, it's not. As I clarified earlier, no natural law prevents R.D. from saying any particular name, just as no natural law was suspended now. Though a bag of fruit juice powder was suspended to the underside of the barrel lids and dissolved into the water once the lids were placed on top. Hey, 
Ah, that's why Miracle Mitch had to make sure the barrels were full. Good job, Mitch. Now the real miracle is getting 120 gallons of fake grape juice out of the recording room. 119.234 gallons of juice. For those who prefer the metric system, that's 451.3484 liters. I'm sure Mitch will help. Nope. Don't want to stain my hose. Well, I'm out of here. Non-Miraculous Jerry has left the building. Hey! Anybody want some mayhaws? Grew some as big as melons. Got them right there in the truck. Well, that's it from Jeremy. Oh, and it's still Jerry. Sure, still Jerry. Sure. Me, R.D., and the whole Crystal Sea juice crew for today. If you want to hear more, try out crystalseabooks.com where... We're not perfect, but our boss is. So, Jay, what are some of the big lessons that we can all learn from Jesus' first miracle when he turned the water into wine? Yes, absolutely. Thank you for asking that. For me, the primary or the most prevalent or important of the points is that the miracle at the wedding reveals Jesus' divine nature. By turning water into wine, Jesus is demonstrating his authority over creation and displays his power to perform supernatural acts. This event serves as a sign of his divine identity and sets the stage for his whole ministry. And to me, it's especially beautiful and kind of unique and God way of doing things that our Lord decided to begin his public ministry with wine and with weddings. So one point we should note about Jesus' first miracles was that it was the first time that he displayed his divine power. Now, other people in redemptive history, such as Moses and Elijah, had also done miracles. But there was a sense in which Jesus' first miracle was different, wasn't there? Other people had acknowledged that it was God who was doing the miracle. But Jesus could do the miracles himself because he is God, isn't he? Man, you still throw me a tough question, why don't you, right? You know, don't, don't give me an easy one. The miracle at the wedding, you know, where Jesus turns water into wine, it serves as a powerful demonstration of his divine nature and authority over creation. He took a natural substance, water, and he turned it into something entirely different and yet of an exceptional quality. He didn't do this with words even. He didn't do this by touching it. He did this out of his will alone. This was an amazing thing, something that is definitely beyond my scope. And I'd love to meet the person that can do this because we can make a nice, tidy profit turning water into wine. But um, I digress. It's just not possible. So it's something that demonstrates that Jesus himself has literally God's power. Additionally, by transforming a natural substance into something entirely different, he showcases his ability to exercise supernatural power beyond the realm of human capabilities. Also, this act of turning water into wine, it's beyond a simple provision of refreshment. It reveals Jesus' divine authority to manipulate the elements of nature according to his will. It signifies that he possesses a power that transcends the natural laws governing the physical world. Also, it affirms his status as the Son of God. You know, in the Bible, water represents purification and cleansing. And those stone jars, stone is a kosher, clean material. And so water was stored in stone jars for this very purpose of purification and cleansing. And at the same time in the Bible, wine is associated with joy and celebration with abundance. And so by transforming water into wine, Jesus symbolically demonstrates his ability to bring spiritual transformation. That is joy and fulfillment into the lives of his people. It signifies his role as the source of eternal life and the one, the only one, who can satisfy the deepest longings of the human soul. Not to mention that the quality of the wine produced by Jesus surpassed anything the wedding taster had ever tried. This emphasizes that Jesus wants to surpass in our lives anything that we ever imagined. That he not only has the power to create, but excels in providing abundantly and surpassing human expectations. It reflects a desire to offer new and abundant life to those who believe in him, contrasting with the inadequacies of old ways and religion, but instead with richness found in relationship with him. Overall, the act of turning water into wine in this miracle underscores Jesus' divinity, his power over creation, and his ability to provide spiritual abundance and fulfillment. It serves as a foundational sign of his ministry 
setting the stage for the miracles teaching and ultimately for his redemptive work on the cross. By performing this miracle at a wedding, Jesus also highlights his willingness to be part of a joyous occasions of human life and to bless them and transform them. It underscores his desire to be present in everyday moments of human existence, sanctifying and elevating them through his divine intervention. And the fact that Jesus performed his first miracle at a wedding is also very significant, isn't it? I suppose that he could have done his first miracle anywhere, but he chose to do it at a wedding. Why is that important? Well, first of all, you know, God established marriage. That was his idea from the beginning. Jesus was there, as recorded in Genesis 1, 27 and 28, where it says, He created them male and female. He blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply and fill and subdue the earth. The marriage relationship was to reflect our relationship with God. If you think along the lines of the old King James version of Genesis 2, 24, you know, therefore man shall leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. This is an establishment by God. It is the first established relationship that God makes for man outside of one between him and man. It's very important. I'd say this, God has a very high view of marriage. Throughout the history of the Bible and his people, God used marriage to represent that relationship between him and his people. We can look to laws like in Deuteronomy 24, 5. This is how important God thinks marriage is, is that when a man is newly married, he can't even go out with the army. He can't even go out and fight for a whole year. Like God says, you stay home and you work on that marriage. As a former soldier, that's crazy. Like you're going to get to stay and not fight. Get out of here with that mess. But God says, no, marriage is seriously important. The wisdom books, like Proverbs says, someone who finds a wife, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. You can look to the prophets, all of them, but specifically Hosea. The whole thing is based on the idea of an unfaithful wife that's taken back again and again by the faithful husband. And that just like the unfaithful sinner, the wayward wife, that God takes back time and time again, we are that wife. Though we sin, he takes us back. Hosea 2.19 says this way, And I will betroth you with me forever, and I'll betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. And so this idea of weddings is huge within the Old Testament, but it kind of carries forward. It's a critical theme in the understanding the relationship of God, and it expands here in the New Testament on this metaphor. Eventually, Jesus would go on after this to describe himself as the bridegroom in in multiple parables. Like when he was asked about fasting, he said, why would they fast when the bridegroom's with them? When he talks about the day of judgment, he speaks of it as if it was a wedding feast that many are invited to. This idea of marriage is super important to understand. We, his church, his people are his bride. So the choice of a wedding is the setting for Jesus's first miracle carries this whole symbolic meaning. In the Bible, as as of today, wedding feasts are often associated with joy. It's a celebration and the union of God with his people. Jesus' presence at the wedding signifies his desire to be part of this, of these occasions with human life, and his willingness to bless and transform them, as stated. So here we're back at the wedding, and Jesus is about to do something amazing. He's about to demonstrate his power over reality and nature as he, without a word, and honoring the faith of his mother, his mother asked him, he's like, yeah, you know, now's not the time. But here, because she was faithful and she told her servants, just do what he says. And she had faith in him. God honors faith. God honors his own word. Exodus 20, 12 says, honor your father and your mother. So Jesus is obeying his own word and honoring his mother in this way. He does this. And he turns water into wine and really good stuff too. Marriage represents our relationship to God in Christ Jesus. And the wine represents the blood he spilled to protect his bride. In case you missed that, that's Jesus, God himself, shed his own blood to rescue you from sin and to restore you to him. That first miracle of Jesus was also significant in another way, wasn't it? When Jesus turned the water into wine at the wedding, it was also an example of Jesus, who is, of course, God, demonstrating that God rewards faith, right? (laughs) Great question. All right. Well, God honors faith. I mean, we see Mary's faith in this passage. You know, Mary approached Jesus and said, hey, you know, the wine's run out. 
And even though initially Jesus said, no, it's not my time. But in this passage, the wine's run out, and he says that this time has not come. But even still, Mary instructs the servants to do whatever Jesus tells them. Mary's role as an intercessor, asking to save her friends from embarrassment of empty cups, highlights her faith and trust in Jesus' ability to address the problem. You know, God honors faith in general. If you recall, Romans 4.3, we're reminded that Abraham believed in God, that God counted him as righteousness because of his faith, that faith in God credited them righteousness. And we can see this theme played out. And indeed, that's how we get righteousness today is we put our faith in God, but not in this God we don't know or this promise is yet to be fulfilled, but in Jesus that we do know he fulfills that. And so it's still the same salvation is by putting our faith in him. The author of Hebrews reminds us that without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And I think that the faith of Mary and Jesus' power and love was respected by God and honored. Even though he said no the first time, her faith made her act. And I wonder how many times in my own life and in our lives where God says no the first time, and we just give up and we fail to act. And sometimes even that results in us, we lose a little faith. Well, another thing that the miracle at Cana demonstrates is that God is a God who can exceed all of our expectations, right? I'm thinking about Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, where it says, quote, God is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, unquote. Abundance and fulfillment. The miracle of turning water into wine, as recounted in the Gospel of John, showcases Jesus' ability to provide abundantly and surpass human expectations. The wine Jesus creates, as noted before, is of the highest exceptional quality, surpassing all the previous supplies. The abundance that Jesus brings symbolizes the new and abundant life that Jesus brings to sinners. See, it contrasts with the old ways. The old ways, you had no redemption. You only had like atonement. Like you paid the price for a temporary thing and you brought sacrifices over and over again. It did not satisfy once and for all. Whereas what Jesus did does. By providing the finest wine when the previous supply had run out, he not only met the immediate need, but also exceeded it, revealing his power to go beyond what was expected or even thought possible. This abundance serves as a metaphor, y'all. It's a metaphor for the spiritual abundance and fulfillment that can be found with a relationship in Jesus, with Jesus. You know, the wine represents Jesus we know this as written in Luke twenty two twenty. As I mentioned just a moment ago, the Passover meal here, Jesus said this, in the same way he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. Just as the wine brought joy and celebration to the wedding feast, Jesus brings joy and fulfillment to the lives of those who follow him. In him, people discover richness and fullness that transcends the limitations of mere religion. In him, there is a loving relationship. As Jesus himself proclaimed, I came that they may have life and have it more abundantly. It is a life characterized by a deep connection with God, grace, and transformative power. Our old ways left us feeling empty and burdened, but Jesus offers us a life that overflows with meaning and purpose and satisfaction. The miracle of turning water into wine is a powerful demonstration of this ability to bring about abundance and fulfillment. It serves as a reminder that he is not merely concerned with meeting our physical needs, but also with addressing our spiritual hunger and providing the abundant life that our souls long for. In Jesus, we find the true source of satisfaction and the fulfillment of our deepest desires. What do you think Jesus meant when he said to Mary that his time had not yet come? What time was he referring to? When Jesus mentions that his time has not yet come in response to Mary's request, he highlights the importance of divine timing in his ministry. Let me back up just a hair. My first thought was, for some reason, when Jesus went into the desert and Satan brought him up to the top, he said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord your God. When he said, jump off and the angels will catch you, brought him to the top of the temple. And there's a difference between testing the Lord and having faith in the Lord. 
And I think that this timing was done to try and highlight the difference. It's that every aspect of Jesus' life and ministry, if we read the Gospels, everyone was intricately connected to God's entire overarching plan of salvation. And choosing a wedding was like the right thing for God. He established weddings. He established marriage. He created one. He is the fruit of the vine. He is the reason for everything. And so having this kind of revelation party where he does this miracle at a wedding does show that it was part of his plan. Everything else was planned. This miracle ended up signifying the beginning of the process of unveiling Jesus' identity as the Messiah. The timing of this miracle was significant because it marked the inauguration of Jesus' public ministry. It was like an inauguration party. I mean, what better way for the king to announce that he's king than to throw a big party and he's there at this party? It served also foreshadowing the signs and wonders and teachings that would progressively reveal his divine nature and redemptive mission. By starting this ministry with a miracle, Jesus indicated that his work on earth was divinely ordained and that it would unfold according to God's perfect timing. Perhaps one more thing we should also note before we close for today is that Jesus meets people where they are. And so many of Jesus' actions during his life we can still understand easily 2,000 years later. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? The miracle at the wedding of Cana really has a timeless dimension. We'd really like to thank Jay Ammerman for being our guest on Anchored by Truth today. I think we can all learn lessons from the miracles that Jesus performed even though they took place 2,000 years ago. And frankly, Jay's life after his conversion is a great illustration of how Jesus continues to redeem destinies in our day and time. For our closing prayer, let's listen to a prayer for the renewal of the church. Certainly one of the prayers we must pay most frequently and most fervently at Anchored by Truth is that God's Word will take an increasing role in the lives of His people and in the life of the church. A prayer for the renewal of the church. Righteous and just Father, you know the thoughts and meditations of your people as no one could. You are the Lord of our hearts and the fulfillment of all of our ambitions. You have numbered the hairs on our head, so you certainly know when we propose to do your will and when we don't. Lord, there are a great many faithful followers of yours in our nation today. There are many whose hearts are totally devoted to you and who want to see your kingdom come and your will be done. Yet within your church, we believe there are many who have been tempted by the snares of the world and a great many who have fallen prey to the evil one. We are saddened and grieved by this and we yearn for restoration and renewal of the church in our land. Lord. If this nation is to survive and remain a land where people may freely worship you, we acknowledge that it will not be done through or by our efforts. Only the Holy Spirit can change the hearts of our countrymen, and we believe that he will act only as we persistently and continuously pray for renewal to come. Words do not do justice to the longings within our spirits to see this nation be visited by another great awakening. As you have done in the past, bring light to your people. Let us learn to handle your word properly and then bring it to the world by Christ's power, through Christ's love, and praying continuously in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Is the Bible important in your life? Supporting Anchored by Truth with a contribution is an easy way to put your faith into action. The opportunity to help is available at crystalseabooks.com. How wonderful would it be for Jesus to commend us because we made His Word a priority in our lives and giving. We are grateful for your support and partnership. We hope you'll be with us next time, and we hope you'll take some time to encourage friends to tune in also or to listen to the podcast version of this show. If you'd like to hear more, try out crystalseabooks.com where We're not perfect, but our boss is. And for those of you who need that website one more time, that's crystalseabooks.com. 
Crystal, C-R-Y-S-T-A-L-C-S-E-A, and books, B-O-O-K-S dot com. Thank you for your support.